as I start, I've, I've put together a little introduction about each one of you. We'll see if you like it. <laughs> so just to, to have awareness of, of, of um, what, what the producers are about. Um, Number Nine is an independent production company led by two producers, uh, Liz Carlson and Stephen Woolley. The company is a very prolific producer with many successful uh, releases under its belt. And I'll just run through a few titles and they will all be perfectly familiar to you. But I think it's really nice to think about them on that spectrum, how much they are kind of... British made for international audience and going on to made with international partners or even you could think of them as projects that originated maybe elsewhere and got your involvement as a, as a co-producer. So there's a really nice mix there amongst those titles. And they are. The most recent is Colette, which is still in post-production. Uh, directed by uh, Wash, uh, Westmoreland and the director of Still Alice. That's in collaboration with Killer Films in the US. Um, and it's been shot, parts of it at least, in Hungary, right? And Paris. And Paris. Um, this is actually your second collaboration with Killer Films. Third, sorry. Uh, after Carol, uh, Todd Haynes... Um, 1950s drama with, with Kate Blanchett and the other one, I don't know. Oh, uh, Mrs. Harris. Oh, Mrs. Harris. Oh, okay. Okay. Then we have a title such as um, Limehouse Gollum, which is America-based director, but a British film with U.S. sole company, I think, right? Yeah, it's a French-Spanish director. A French-Spanish director and uh, the financing mostly came out of the UK and it's an adaptation of a Peter Ackroyd novel by Jane Goldman. Lovely. And then there's an adventure with uh, Lon Scherfig on Their Finest. Mm -hmm. So that has a proper sort of flavour of, of a co-production, co-production within the UK because you've done it with Wild Gaze Films. <laughs> and then there were partners also in Sweden, I think, yeah. right? Uh, on Chesil Beach with BBC Films, mm -hmm. New Jordan's Byzantium with parallel films in um, Ireland. And finally, uh, let's not forget that you are also UK co-producer on Paolo Sorrentino's Youth. Now that is quite some range here, can you see? <laughs> so we're, we're, we're very much looking forward to delving into this. Now Emily, perhaps not that far on that journey, but a very sort of spectacular debut. Uh, with your recent film, I Am Not a Witch, which I understand is your first time as a feature pr film producer? Uh, yeah, it was my first time as sort of a lead producer, as it were, whereas I'd worked within companies before and associate produced, co-produced, and yeah. yeah. Exactly. So a really, a, a really strong sort of departure, if you like. The, the, the film sprung into life at Cannes. Uh, screening in Director's Fortnight, right? Yeah. That's where it kind of started its um, exposure to the audiences in the market. Um, closed the Discovery Programme in Toronto and then played at the London Film Festival. So it's already um, making quite strong rounds at, uh, uh, in, in the festival circuit. It was released theatrically in cinemas uh, here in yeah. October already. Sunday is a big night for Emily. Do you want to say why? Yeah, the Biffers. We have uh, 13 nominations, which is it's great. Spectacular. Yeah, <laughs> and in the new year, the film is heading to Sundance and is released in France. Yeah, right. France That's um, yeah. So so quite quite some run for a debut film by a Zambian um, Welsh director, Rangano Nyoni. And the first time for, 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 for Emily. Emily also develops films from her company, Quiddity Films, but she's also collaborating with other producers, like with Hot Property Films um, and Soda Pictures, I think. That, that well, was I was in-house at Soda for a couple of years and now I'm sort of just working through my own company. But because I'm sort of just me, I do find that even within the UK, I'm partnering with different producers on, on all my projects, really. So, yeah, yeah but the I Bureau, think Hot Property Films, yeah. yeah. It's, it's quite an interesting um, um, uh, journey, again, because 
a lot of times we feel compelled to grow our own production company from the day go, whereas perhaps it's actually good to work with others when you still to need to learn things and um, concentrate on your own business maybe a bit, a bit later on. So Liz, maybe let's start uh, with you. Um, you've been having quite a terrific run with four films in two years. That's quite a, quite a roller coaster uh, life, I can imagine. Um, is working with partners a, a, a recipe for being able to do more and do better films in the end? I mean, I, I think like any recipe, it can go really badly wrong if you don't look it up first and think, oh, this looks like something I'd like to eat. Um, you know, partnerships, I think that we work in an industry which is, it's a creative industry and it is collaborative in every possible way. Uh, the creative aspects of it, the financing, and, you know, collaboration means partnerships. And if you choose your partnerships wisely and you make sure that you both share an understanding of the project that you're making, then for us, certainly, they've been incredibly um, fruitful and enjoyable. Um, and they've come about in different ways. The partnership with Killer Films, which is run by Christine Bashan and, and Pamela Koffler, is Christine and I actually first met as proofreaders a million years ago. <laughs> Um, before the ICA was built, probably. And we started making short films together. Um, and at that time, I was living in New York, and we'd had a similar academic background at university, and, and I did a postgraduate degree. So it's sort of then, all those years later, when Mrs. Harris came around, which was a script that Phyllis Nage, who is actually American, UK American, and she was living in London at the time. She'd been brought over by Daldry to work at the Royal Court. She was a playwright. And she was first introduced to me by Jenny Casarotto, and she came in and pitched this uh, true life crime story that I loved. Um, and she wrote this stunning script, and it was so particular that I thought actually Phyllis should direct it. But I just had our third baby, and it was just too much to be based in the UK, not even in London, and have a third baby, and to try and do a film, because we cast Annette Benning. Um, and she wanted to film in LA because she had just had a fourth baby or whatever, or third, whatever it was about. And it was just she needed to be there. So I just said to Christine, do you guys want to come on board because you're there and you're on the ground? And I thought that's going to make it much easier. Um, as it was, I ended up moving out to LA for four and a half months and um, bringing one of the kids with me and leaving two here. Not that my personal life really matters, but maybe it does actually because most people try and juggle both or some people. Um, so it came out of that, and then when Carol came around, Phyllis, I commissioned Phyllis and she did Carol, and then um, when I sent it to Todd, obviously Christine has worked with Todd since they were at college together, and that's a relationship that should be preserved and acknowledged, and you know, Christine and I were great friends, so we said, look, if Todd wants to do it, obviously you guys come on board, so that's how that happened. And then with Colette, um, Pam sent me a script and said, look, Wash has written this script and we think there's probably something in it. Do you want to have a look? Because it all shoots in, in Europe. And so I read that and thought, gave it to Stephen and that came out of that. So it's been a great relationship because we work in a similar way and we share similar sensibilities. And, you know, it's like Emily was saying, even when you're at art, time of life, um, it's just great to have partners, it really is. But that's, that's a very important thing to underline, that this is a relation that has been going on over several decades. Yeah. So within those decades you have three titles, mm -hmm. and probably the first title is not in the, necessarily in the first year you've known each other. And there's this, this issue of, of, of trust and of finding mm. the right partner. If you, if you find the right partner, you keep them. Yeah. Is, it, is it not the case? That it's not really, ideally, it's not just project-based, but mm. you develop those relationships with people that you will have. Well, I think it's across the board. I mean, well, you know, you, Jenny, I think, was one who said, keep your team with you. And obviously, companies that have managed to establish a relationship with a single talent that is repeat over and over again, those are the ones that really grow rapidly and, and um, 
have stature and economic, creative and economic viability. And similarly, you know, right down, I was saying to my post-production coordinator yesterday, she started as my assistant and she's now the post-coordinator. And it is just so great to know that we've had the same post-production accountant for, God, I think 15 years now, the same post-production coordinator for the same amount of time. It's just your team and it is just so fantastic because whether you're relying on them because you need to do something else and you think, well, Polly's got that covered, or whether she sends you an email going, can I just remind you that that is a completely unreasonable request and you should be saying no? And also, by the way, why are you spending money on this? And you go, oh, thanks so much for telling me off. Yes, you're right. But Sorrentino is expanding on that on that network, right? So you're always, you're always casting your net a bit yeah. wider. And now perhaps... Indigo in Italy could mm -hmm. be growing into that more, mm -hmm. not, not permanent, nothing's permanent, but um, your relations with Indigo or Parallel, they're, yes. they're again not meant to be for possibly just yeah. one project, but it's your sort of ecosystem yeah. of collaborations, right? Could well, you tell the, us about the Palo Sorrentino thing? Again, was interesting because way back when um, Stephen Willem, our partner, had done a big studio film called Interview with a Vampire with Neil Jordan. And it was cast by um, a casting director called Juliet Taylor, who was the grand dame of casting. And she had an assistant working with her called Laura Rosenthal. And then when I went on to produce a Terence Davis film with Jenna Rowlands, which was in the States, I knew that Laura, I think Stephen might have mentioned, oh, you should give Laura a call because I think she wants to branch out on her own. And so the first film that Laura, who is now, you know, the new Juliet Taylor, you'll see Laura has just worked with every great director there is. She's a phenomenal casting director. And she, the first film she got sole casting director credit for was on Neon Bible. She then cast Carol all those years later because she'd become Todd Haynes' casting director. And she called up and she said, are you a fan of Paolo Sorrentino's? And that's one of those, is the Pope a Catholic, you know, and to bear shit in the woods, kind of, yes. And she said, well, he's doing this project and needs a UK co-producer. So I thought of you guys, should I put you in touch? Because she had been casting for... Paolo on a couple of, you know, she often would work with European directors who need help on American parts. Um, so she put us in touch, but simultaneously actually Adrian Wooten, who used to run the London Film Festival and is on Film London, who'd become a great friend, he had also recommended us to Paolo. In that case, they sent the script, we read it that afternoon, and I said to Stephen, I think it's terrific, we better get on a plane tomorrow and go to Rome. And I just, one thing you learn in this business, you just have to do it. You just have, and so we emailed Indigo and said, look, we'll come to Rome tomorrow. And they went, oh, you read it. We said, yeah, it's great. We'll, we'll be there for lunch. And so we had lunch with Nicola and Carlotta, who were the two of the producers there, and with Paolo Sorrentino, and just talked about the project. And it was a fantastic lunch. And we'd done the deal three days later. If there was an American company, you wouldn't do the deal three days later. <laughs> with Europeans, you can actually do a deal in a few days. Um, not to denigrate one against the other, it's just more tricky. Uh, so, And they said afterwards, well, it was just incredible because we'd gone out to a few producers, but when you guys said, oh, we'll fly out and have lunch with you 24 hours later, they thought, well, these are the people we'll work with. And so it was a great experience doing youth. Um, and our role as the UK co-producer, there was some filming in London, but I have to, it was only a day, but we set all that up, but we brought other monies to the table, which I guess we'll get into later. But we uh, really liked working with Indigo, and so we've got another project that's in development with them, and um, they're a company that we would really love to work with again. I think we could carry on. We, okay. we, we could talk about what, what your role was so as a, as a we UK... we said we could bring different sums of money to the table. There's obviously the UK tax credit, um, which in the end, actually, the spend wasn't high enough, the total spend of the budget. There's a floor that you have to, to get to, um, and we didn't hit that, so we didn't bring UK tax credit. But we brought equity, a license and equity money from uh, Film 4 that was through Tessa Ross at the time. And we also brought the UK sale from Studio Canal, the UK theatric sale, 
in. So that was a pretty big sum of money. And we could also, we were applying for money from the media side of, the co-production side of the BFI, but we just, the paperwork was, it was, there was too much for us to get through in the time that we needed to, but there was the potential there for a sizable sum, um, but we didn't access that in the end. That's to do with the Hungarian part no, of it? No, that, that was just because uh, the Paolo Sorrentino film was shot in Italy, Switzerland. It was an Italian, Swiss, UK co-production. Mm -hmm. um, so we were going to access European co-production money through Isabel Beggs, but we didn't. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not always right. We, we will talk about yeah. this, so about this business of official co-production or not official co-production. I think the main mission, the main kind of uh, um, ambition is to work with each other. Whatever status you, you work out, whether it's official or not, as long as it works for the producers and for the project, it's, uh, that's, that's, um, that's fine. Um, and yeah, but what, what, what important to stress out is that the Italian producer, the, 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 the originator of the project, they couldn't have done it without you. They, they, they wouldn't get the results that you've got for them as a UK co-producer because of your... Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I'd like to think that. One of the things I've learned in the industry is that no one's indispensable. <laughs> you know, um, it, you know, so yeah, I, you know, they would think that because, of course, we were incredibly proactive and we were there. But one thing as independent producers, which I'm sure you all know, is that you find a way to make it. So I have no doubt if it hadn't been us, they would have found some way of getting it together. But certainly, it yeah, it worked with their, their tripartite co-production structure and we brought something to the table and the film got made and everyone was incredibly proud of it and it got into, you know, worldwide release and played the festivals and um, award nominations and has led to a creative relationship. Mm, that's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Yes, thank you. We'll, we'll move on to, to you, Emily. Um, you are also chasing talent, I think, with your, with your film. Could you tell us how um, I Am Not a Witch came about and how, how you discovered that project and, and the filmmaker? Yeah, so um, I actually did a, a short film in 2012 that Rangano had written uh, that her creative and um, well, husband and creative sort of writing, directing partner um, was directing as well as at the NFTS. Um, and so from then we made that short together and then we just always stayed in touch and I sort of followed the fact that she was writing the script and I loved the idea, but actually I wasn't formally involved as a producer because there was a French producer who'd seen the short film that she'd directed, which was actually nominated for a BAFTA that I hadn't worked on. But I was just very aware of her as a real talent, even though she'd only written the short that I'd uh, produced. And so this French producer had seen that short in a festival somewhere and had kind of really run after her as well, chasing the talent and Hopped had become... on a plane, yeah, got exactly, to lunch in. Got it, yeah. <laughs> um, and so then she... And I think she was really useful in that she encouraged Rangana to apply to stuff like the Cine Fondation. So she really nurtured the development of it. And I was just in the wings as a friend, meeting up with them in London and always in touch and knowing that I wanted. And it was sort of good that I had some time. She spent about four years to write the script. That in a way I had time to kind of prepare myself as a producer as well. So in a way I feel great for it took a while. Because um, then by the time she had the script ready with Juliette, my co-producer, I was felt in a good position. By then I was at Soda and I was sort of finding projects to bring in house. And, and it was of everything that crossed my desk, the thing that blew me away most. And and I think, yeah, and then it, it came together quite quickly, really. Um, so, so the script was there and the film was ready to start getting finance. What needed sorting is the um, co-production setup between you and Juliet, right? Yeah, exactly. How, how the fact that it had Juliet on as a French producer. You know, the English funders, because in the end it, it was the BFI, Film 4 and Film Agency Wales, because Rangano's Welsh originally. And... Um, so they were all quite keen and, and but Juliette obviously definitely wanted to be involved in the film because it had been her baby for all these years. And also, I think we all felt strongly that it was obviously going to be quite an art house proposition. It would need to have a kind of strong festival launch. So it was good to have ties with funds like the Berlin World Cinema Fund and the Hubert Bowles um, Europe Plus Fund that we got. And so they were all very sort of within and it also gave us sort of good 
stakes in those countries when it came to distribution. And so it, it definitely made sense not just to go down the UK route, even though it looked like they would all be quite interested and give us a decent... And oh, yeah, because there was another complication with those world cinema funds. There was a budget cap of a million euros. So actually, we couldn't be more than that, even though what we wanted to do was pretty big, bringing loads of crew from Europe and going over to Zambia, a country where no one's ever made a film of any sort of real scale before. Um, so that was a constriction, but still we decided to go down the, you know, keep it very European and, yeah. um, and then Juliette also because she got the CNC World Cinema funding as well, so. But, but, but you, you, you just said it, but maybe you can elaborate yeah. on this a bit more, that it probably would have been possible to get mm. all that money in the UK and simpler, but the film gained extra advantages by being set up in this more complex international uh, context. Yeah. And that includes a facilitated access to audiences. I think it yeah, felt like that, that it gave it this, yeah, it felt like it, we were keen for it to be a European film, I guess, and, and, we knew, and France was the biggest sale for the film in the end in terms of distribution, and so I think that, that and instinct that was That you right. would appropriate due to the fact that there was a French co-producer, you think? I think that helped as well, Could yeah, exactly, yeah. A so, um, I mean, I suppose, I, I, guess I do keep coming back to the fact, though, that she was just involved as well, and it was her, and she wanted, she didn't want to just be a token producer if yeah. it was all produced in the UK, so she actually really drove that European side as well, and even when it came to our sales agent, she was, you know, we had offers from UK sales agents, but she was very determined that it was a French one, and... Um, she wanted to give it that identity that she'd come, to, you know, with yeah. her territory that she'd come to the project with. Yeah, this is for, for the for the risk of saying something terribly obvious, but the the the, the beauty of co-production is that in every co-producing country, the film is the national film, so it it shares the kind of nationality of all the co-producing countries. So, as it was a British film for Emily, it was a f very much French film for. Uh, Juliet, and that's that's the that's the magic of it. Mm. Um, maybe we can. Oh, but sorry. then, should yes. I say the thing about the official co-production or um, not? Is that all we come to that later? Well, let's let's just talk about. Well, we can talk about it now. Yeah, because so we did go through at one point. It was going to be through the European Conventional French UK French official co-production, but that then actually on the French side because it was all going to be shot in Zambia. Um, it couldn't, and we didn't have enough points, so we were thinking, oh gosh, do we need to get some French actors? We needed actors, basically, but then that would have really jeopardised the kind of creative integrity of the project, because it was supposed to be Zambian non-actors. That was Rungano's vision for it. So we then had to, f we then made it a British film. I think it was more worth getting the UK tax credit than having it as a, an official French, or making it a French film, or doing any of that. Yeah, it was... But we definitely went down that route and then made it not a co-production, but it still is a co-production, so it's just not official through the treaties. Yeah. Exactly. Well, this is just what we've heard from you. You just do the maths and see which um, avenue would be the most beneficial for the film and it, uh, it just make it work, right? Um, maybe moving over to you, Liz, and uh, this, this working with partners, which makes it a bit more complex, but also more rewarding, perhaps using the examples of their finest and Byzantium, because they were a bit more collaborative. Um, yeah. what, what's the and gains? Maybe the, <laughs> and, and Colette, because that's a very different kind of partnership. So with um, the Wild Gaze, relationship with Wild Gaze on their finest, Again, um, Amanda Posey and Fanola Dwyer, who run Wild Gaze, were both worked with me and Stephen at a company um, called Scala that came out of Palace. So we also go back a long way. And um, Amanda was Stephen's assistant on Interview with the Vampire. And then our post-production supervisor on a TV series that we did. But this is all way back when. And then when Stephen and I split off, Fanola and Amanda split off and set up Wild Gaze. Um, and an editor who had worked with Stephen on a film he directed called Stone said, oh, you should read this book. I think you'd love it. Because Stephen is born and bred a Londoner and he just loves everything about London and is steeped in its culture and its history and British films. And I mean, he's a cineast anyway, an encyclopedia on film. 
global film. <laughs> it's very impressive. But he read this book and loved it, and so we called up the agent and said, inquired about the rights, and the agent, who he knew well, said, oh, God, this is a little bit tricky because there's only one other person who's competing for them. And we went, well, that's okay. We'll just, we don't mind being in a bidding war. It's fine. And they said, no, it's really awkward because she's a really good friend of yours. <laughs> And we said, well, who is it? And they said, it's Amanda Posey. So we said, well, that's all right. And we'll just ring up Amanda. So we just rung Amanda and Stephen rung her and said, look, we love this book. You love this book. There's no point in being competing against each other. Let's just make it together. And Amanda is wonderful. Both Amanda and Fanola are amazing producers and great friends and wonderful. And she said, oh, good. That sounds good. So it was, um, you know, and Stephen and Amanda, they, it was really their project that... Cause, in their company, Wild well, Gays like our company, and similar to Killer, is it's usually, you know, you wouldn't do something that the other person doesn't like, that really hates. I mean, if you've got reservations, you'd kind of go, oh, I've got some reservations, but I can see you're really passionate about it. And then one or other of you will really drive that project forward, and the other one will dip in and out, which is what's so great about a partnership, because you know, the thing that makes the film business so ridiculously addictive is the highs are high and the lows are low. <laughs> and, you know, it just really is like that. And so when something is really low, and also when something's very high, you want to have a partner there so you can go, oh, God, the actress has fallen out, the financier pulled out, you know, we're X number in the hole, how are we going to survive? Or, wow, we got six Oscar nominations and nine BAFTAs, you know, should we go out? <laughs> um, so... It was, uh, you know, Stephen and Amanda loved working together and they really drove it creatively and just were, you know, and Amanda's also born and bred Londoner and I think there was just something there and working with Lona and Gemma, who we'd done Made in Dagna the musical with. Um, so that was very much a creative uh, partnership and worked together on all aspects because we work on films from the ground up typically, almost all of our projects. You know, you find the novel like their finest in galley copy, and then take it all the way through, um, right to the very to the very end of its life. Um, but on, and that was similar with Byzantium. That came from Stephen's relationship with Neil, a bit like you with Rungano. He'd seen um, Neil's first film that was done for TV called Angel, and then on the back of that came a relationship that went on for decades. You know, starting with Company of Wolves, which was really a seminal, seminal independent film, an amazing film. Um, and then we needed an Itali a, a, a Irish co-producer, and Neil had heard about Alan Maloney, and so out of that, I think we did three films in the end with Parallel. Um, but the relationship with Pioneer, I'll just say briefly, on Colette was very much, they get a co-producer credit, and like you, we went down the official co-production route, but for various reasons to do with points, to do with paperwork that was required, to do with the difference in tax credit, we actually just decided, let's just go down the production service, the PSA, which is Production Service Agreement. So we hired Pioneer Films, who are excellent, just as a production service company, and they just get a fee in the budget. Um, and so that relationship really was just a service relationship, where when we turned up in Hungary, well, leading up to it, there was lots of preparation, but we shot there for six weeks. So they serviced that shoot. So, yeah, exactly. And th But this was structured in that way, so they, their role was clearly defined as a service provider, and that yeah. worked as well. It just uh, depends. It did. I mean, I think, so, you know, Ilda Kenny, who runs Pioneer with her partners, who's a fantastic woman, she was at the National Film School, um, the NFTS, um, many years ago. But really, she, I had seen um, Duke of Burgundy, and I thought the costumes on that, and also the Brady Corbet film, Childhood of a Leader. And I was now Childhood of a Leader. I thought, wow, those costumes are really unbelievable and I saw she'd done Duke of Burgundy and so I could say to Ildiko look you know we're thinking of hiring she's a local Hungarian costume um, designer and obviously it will be a lot cheaper for the budget but you know it's it is something you just have to face it's wrong and we have to change it but there'll be an attitude you know the American money and director like oh local Hungarian costume designer or and we Ildiko said she's a great friend of mine, she is fantastic, you should definitely meet with her. And just yesterday we were in the grade and her costumes are just sensational. It was a big step for her, but she just did an incredible job. So Ildiko is a filmmaker in her own right. You know, she's got um, creative intuitions and instincts and that makes it um, 
great to work with her. Yeah, and on another project, it might end up being a yeah. proper co-production. It just depends depends how it all stacks up. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Emily, um, you in particular, because I think I think people in the audience might be thinking, well, these guys have it easy. They know everybody already, and when they just need something, they pick up the phone. But how do you get there? How how do you what what is the part of producers' life and and work to get connected? How do you start that process? Um, well, I think after I'd made I'm Not a Witch and it sort of started to do, I suppose in Cannes, I did a quite a bit of a kind of like, I almost feel my shoulder sort of went like that. I thought, God, that's the end of 10 years of like <laughs> trying and dreaming and wanting and being a scheme queen, meeting everyone, trying, hustling. I mean, yeah. I, had, I didn't stop for 10 years. I think when I was at university, I studied languages and knew, but also studied cinema. I knew I wanted to kind of blend the two in terms of getting to know other cultures and portraying them and understanding them. And so my dream was to be a co-producer, work abroad within film, because I'm obsessed with film. And, and, then that's, and then it was finding my role within that. And I tried different things, editing, distribution for a while and then sort of found my calling us but well, then production then thought actually I'm more interested in the creative side so I went to the NFTS to kind of work out my sensibility and make short films and and all along the way just meeting people talking going to festivals with my shorts um taking part in any scheme not really being able to pay my rent but you know making sacrifices I suppose and just sort of um so it does feel like <laughs> It took, it took a while, but I, I feel, yeah, I, it's the graft, I suppose. of yeah. and, and that graft does involve what some people might perceive as socialising and just being out. But it's just always meeting and talking and, and I suppose, being inspired by the people around. And the, oh, the other huge thing, which is why I've always been so inspired by Steve whenever I see him talk, is this encyclopedic knowledge of cinema and knowing what it is you're watching. And I'm always a bit surprised when I hear producers or filmmakers that go to say can and they don't see a single film because I think well why you need to go a to be reminded why we're doing this weird thing and why are we there because the beauty you know why are we not lawyers or or doing other stuff it's the medium and knowing the films and I think to be kind of creatively involved as a producer as well you've got to know the references and so yeah but yes well in short it is that you need to go out there <laughs> Yeah, there's there's no other way there's no there's no uh, substitute for that even if it's if it feels as kind of light as socializing it is not it is how those relations are are built and it's very difficult to just sort of kind of build them from scratch in a span of a week or two sometimes it could happen but normally it really does does take time to develop that and trust just, really yeah and i think it's also about taking part in things. I don't mean the kind of networking, like arriving at an event and working the room and thinking who you want to just go up to and talk to. I think also what's been really good is sort of like scheme, you know, like getting to know people, not like just Like what we of were talking evening. about this morning. Uh, yeah. You, you weren't is here, oh, okay. but that's, that's what we were trying to tease out. How is it different to go through a training course than to go to a market and have a few glasses of wine? Yeah, I think people that's... People share an small intense point. experience together, and that's yeah. how friendships are well, made. I, I think also, and Emily, I mean, I, I think that the film Emily produced is, is just really... Uh, extraordinary and I saw it in the cinema and, and just thought wow there really is a director's voice in this film and you don't always see it and it, I have to hats off to you it's such an achievement um, and I think what it shows is it is absolutely the graft it's all you just have to get your head down and it's an industry where there's a lot of noise all the time and it's noise that is um, even louder as technology develops and as journalism is under threat. So Variety now send, I don't know if you get them, you get emails where, hey, got a story, call us up. You know, they're just so, which means just endless announcements. So and so is directing this, so and so is doing this, this got, and you have to just shut that noise out and just get your head down and get on with it and make it about the work. And I think what Emily's film showed is, you know, I'm not a witch is not an obvious sell. It really is not an obvious sell. And 
you could say that in the current climate, it arrived at the right time where people were suddenly going, okay, so we can't just make films about white heterosexual males. You know, that's gone on for too long. So you were kind of, as you said, oh, maybe it was good the film took four years because you might have had a harder time to raise the finance four years ago. But even given that, you know, it's a challenging film for all the obvious reasons. There's no, no names in it. Emily hadn't produced a film before. You know, Rangano hadn't directed a film before. They filmed in a country where a film hadn't been shot before. It's a really difficult story. I mean, it was bloody hard. I probably wouldn't have been able to do it, to be honest. You know, that's the trouble with getting old and getting close, you know, sort of. I don't know if there is a top, but anyway. It's hard because you get burdened by your own, oh, well, this is how things get done and this is the stories you tell. Whereas when you're Emily, you don't really know that stuff. You're just so fueled by a passion <laughs> and you just go, oh, this is what I want to make. And so consequently, because she wasn't going, oh, I wonder what's happening. I wonder what kind of film I should be making. She spotted a talent and then you know, and also didn't let kind of envy or anything. She thought, well, I know that Rangana is working with someone, but I'm going to offer my support and I'll be here as a friend. And, you know, because of that, look, and it doesn't always happen. No one sets out to make a bad film, but you made a film that really everyone, well, you know, Sunday nights, these 13 nominations, it's a real achievement. And you have to just, because you will always, I mean, with a crying game, you know, we had studio execs tell us that it was morally reprehensible, <laughs> really. We had a letter from a studio exec saying you needed to know, I don't know, maybe all of you have seen it or not seen it, you need to know the big reveal, which is right sort of halfway, three quarters of the way through the film, you need to know that in the first 10 minutes. Who did then send a letter after Neil won the Oscar for best screenplay and said, I just thought you might want to see your, my notes and why I'm an executive and you're an Oscar nominated producer. <laughs> So that's one for the book. So that was very gracious of him. But, you know, you will have people tell you that your film is just, just forget about it. No one's going to go see it or no one wants to make it. And not just when they're at treatment stage or idea stage, but I always think everyone knows the story, but maybe you don't. But when Slumdog Millionaire was fully shot and edited and completed and Warner's decided to clutch, shut down Warner's Independent, which was their specialty art. Because all these studios are like, oh, look at what um, Fox Searchlight are doing. That's great. Let's set up Paramount Vantage, Warner's Independent, you know, Fine Line Cinema. And they all thought, well, let's do that. And then they realized, actually, we're just a huge machine and we just don't know how to put these little, you know, ankle socks that we're putting through the washing machine are just clogging up the whole system. You know, we want the big, um, you know, Bell and Chaga cashmere jumpers or something. We don't want the little socks. So they just go, we'll take them all out of the machine and give them to someone else. So they screened, Danny Boyle and Christian Coulson went to LA and screened the finished film for Warners, big Warners, because they'd closed Warners Independent in the process of making the film. And the head chief executives at Warners saw the film and just went, well, straight to DVD. <laughs> I mean, you know, are you serious? It's in Hindi and there's no one in this film that anyone knows. Well, hey, what are we gonna do with this? Straight to DVD. And they said, and I think Tessa played a part in this as well. They just said, please, just give us 24 hours. Please, just give us 24 hours. Went to Peter Rice, who had nurtured Danny Boyle from Train Spotting. He's a, originally British and is now, you know, a major player. And, and uh, showed it to him. And he said, absolutely, we want to buy it. He was at Fox Searchlight. They called Warners. They did the deal. Um, and those were one of those instances where actually in America you could do a deal quickly because obviously big Warners were going, oh my God, someone's going to pay us money for this? Wow. <laughs> you know, eight Oscar wins later, you can imagine that head of Warner Brothers was sitting in the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion feeling a little bit sick. But, you know, it happens to everyone. So it's the nature of the business, which again is why it's so addictive because you never know. <laughs> We've got a really long-standing relationship with sales agents. So we've worked with Hanway many, many, many times. And Hanway was set up by Jeremy Thomas, who was Bertolucci's producer, who has, you know, his life's work has been about defying expectations and challenging and pushing back the envelope. So definitely the sales company was born out of that space. Um, 
And we, from Hanway, uh, a younger sales company has set up recently called Rocket Science. And we have done films with Rocket Science. Um, and they, with us, you know, they tend to now, they're looking for reliable products. So when they come to us, they know that they've got a good chance of getting a film that uh, they will be able to sell. So we're in a slightly different situation. So if they did a poster image and we said, you're selling this completely the wrong way, we really don't think that works. And also because Stephen comes from distribution. So he's got a very strong sense in distribution. Um, I think, though, that what's important, that if you really believe in something, you're going to spend so much time bringing around um, converting you know, the, the dissenters, and there will be many of them. And you need, again, getting back to the thing with partnerships, there are a whole, a vast range of sales agents out there, and sales agents tend to specify in a, uh, um, specialize in a type of film. So you want to try and go to a sales agent who... Uh, you know, like a celluloid dreams type would have been the perfect person for I'm Not a Witch or Vince, Vincent Maraval or someone like that or the Bureau or they are definitely out there. So you start with them and then if you're not getting anywhere, you know, if some sales agent steps in and says, well, we're going to give you figures that are bankable and that you can, well, you know, we can do a few cornerstone pre-sales, then you're going to go, if there's no other source that you think, well, they're a better partnership, they're a better fit creatively, but these people are giving me the money. And then all you can try and do is get in there and say, no, we want our poster to look this way. Or, you, But, I mean, yeah, see, we tend as well, often we have such strong relationships with distributors in France, typically France, Germany, Australia, Spain, the UK. So often with those sales, the sales company will even say to us, look, you can, can you do those sales yourself? Can you ring them up and say, this is a new project? And what actually has come out of that is now um, distributors have given us development money for projects. Like Colette, we got development money from a distributor that we have worked with repeatedly in Europe. And that's been really cool because there's no co-production or anything. But they've come to us now because they're so desperate for product that they know that they need, like you chasing the talent, they need they get in there early. So they say, what do you have? Oh, we've got this project, but we need to rewrite. They go, oh, great, well, we'll fund it. Fun, we'll find the rewrite for you, and then they'll get a first look in exchange, so. Um, I think uh, just applying for getting jobs on films where I've worked with inspirational producers has been good. Um, and then going, I suppose also just my, my peers as well, the people like my longest collaborator director called Claire Oakley, um, who we've done all our shorts together and we've just kind of come on the journey together and I think that helps. So work, you know, reading lots of short film scripts, talking to lots of, you know, directors at the same and writers at the same level um, to find the projects that you'll have together to go and start getting funding and, and then all these feature film schemes as well. I mean, I'm told there wasn't as many before, like all this microwave and eye features and stuff like that. I think there's a lot of those structures in place to, to apply to. And, um, but yeah, I think in tough, it's hard. And then, I mean, I would recommend, I think the, going to National Film Television School was one route. It wasn't, I was in a bit of a dilemma about going there because I'd started working at a company at the time, but then I did do it and I'm glad I did, but it was, only, it was a route. I think, it's, I mean, I'd say just keep following your instinct and your gut, but do you think, I mean, because there's obviously an element of luck as well, but I think, mm -hmm coming back to what you want to make and what you feel driven to do, I think it, I can't, do, yeah. Do, do you mentor people, Liz? Yeah, I have mentored quite a few people and it's very satisfying when they, I mean, there was a, um, I mentored quite a few people from the NFTS because I used to be on the, one of the people who would um, interview prospective producing applicants. Um, but I've mentored quite a few people, and I mentored a woman um, there called Ray, who was Icelandic. And she was great, because she was really like, email, you know, you're supposed to have another session with me. And I'd be like, oh, God, Ray's on it. Shit. Said to my assistant, oh, you better set that up, you know. And then when I'd finished, Ray's like, I need to meet with you. And I thought, oh, God, I thought that was over, my mentoring. 
And uh, I had a drink with her, and, and I was kind of thinking in my back of my mind, well, I guess she's going to go far, because actually she's got that thing of just... And she said, um, she said, well, I, I, what? I said, well, what do you want to do, Ray? She goes, well, I want to work in sales. And I thought, phew, you know, she wants to work in sales. And Rocket Science had just set up. So I emailed her, I said, look, she was, I mentored her, she seems really on it, don't know, never worked with her, but do you want to meet with her? I mean, Ray is now basically, it seems to be running the company. <laughs> She's, she's been hired full time and she is just like a tenacious and of course she does all those things that everyone else, you get to mind, she's like, oh God, do I really have to look over that? And uh, so just emails from Ray endlessly and Torsten and Kiara, thank you so much for sending Ray. But it's great, so yeah, I do. And I, yeah, there's just no right way. I mean, Stephen was a cinema show. I went to university to study genetics, you know. <laughs> so, they're just, I, yeah, just the graft. And I mean, I, I would say not to say it's easier now, but there are so many platforms, they call them, so many different outlets for storytelling. And I mean, I know from my daughters who are in their early 20s, it seems as though short films have really had a serious renaissance and it is a real place. And I, I know I, you also get whisperings like from, Hollywood, people are now going, oh, intention span, we don't want these series that go on, you know, 13 episodes, seven series that you have to get through. It's actually about shorter formats that people are really engaging with, where you can watch something on the bus, or you can watch something on the tube, and, um, and you know, storytelling can come in any length. So I think that there's an opportunity with your, as we've seen from, you know, sh with Tangerine, um, sorry, with, yeah, Tangerine, you can, you can do it on your iPhone. So... But, but it's, it, is, it is an ambitious question, really, because I, I, I'm sure that there's as many models as film titles. It's yeah. not quite possible to answer it in... in, in any one way, really. Yeah. Um, I, I would say that, you know, we've got the BFI, um, Film 4 and the BBC, we're incredibly lucky. They are yeah. very, very attentive to new up-and-coming filmmakers, as well as established and extremely supportive and, you know, government funds in there. And also media, you know, who knows what's going to happen with that, unfortunately. But that, you know, for our company, media has just been vital to our um, ongoing activities and uh, it's great money because it doesn't come with huge creative strings attached or recruitment schedules or it just really enables you to focus on the work um, and it also will fund overhead which is the hardest money to get um, but you need you need some you know you, you, you have to have some kind of an overhead. This is where we're going next to talk about media money, but because we have you here, I, I would just like to stay with you, Liz, a bit more because you're quite a recidivist there. <laughs> so we always explain to people, because that's our job to do, that you have to bring projects to us with international potential. They don't have to be necessarily structured as co-productions, but they must have international potential. And then there's a whole big topic appearing, what does it mean, right? What, all films are with international potential or not. And I would like to hear from Liz, because she put it in the applications and she did it right to make that case for those projects on the, on the slate, in your case, they were saying convincingly, we are the projects for international market. So what did you put in there? <laughs> we, we submitted for five projects and then we're, you can get awarded a maximum of 180,000 euros, I think. And three get selected. But you know, your budgets, what you state in your budget needs to match what you say in your text and what you say in your finance plan needs to match and everything needs to cross-reference. And as you said, you need to show that the projects have are creatively interesting and have international potential. So the first time we did it was very, very difficult. And each time you do do it, it's a huge amount of work. But obviously, once you've sort of done it once, and we've done it, we've had three successful applications. Um, and actually, I think that it, we did one recently. There were only two UK companies, I think, that were selected. And a lot of companies um, applied. So we were really thrilled about that. Um, Obviously, having the last application we put in, Carol was one of the, 
the projects that we put in. And I think there's probably a couple of things that count in our favor is we don't develop that much. We're a very tiny company. It's me and Stephen, an assistant each, part-time production person, part-time accountant, that's it. And each of those assistants will come onto the film. Mm -hmm. Some people will hire a separate assistant. So uh, we develop few projects because we can't develop that many, but also we feel we can't really monitor if we've got a huge site. So we only really develop about six things at any one time, which consequently means, because we're very hands-on, we have a high, what they call conversion rate, where things actually do get made. Um, and Carol was one of those films that got made. And when we discussed that, even though it was filmed in the States, we talked about you know the rights. Patricia Highsmith spent the last decades of her creative life living in Switzerland. Um, the rights hold Diogenes is a huge European publisher that had the rights. Phyllis Nage was UK, Stephen and I were based here. Sandy Powell, who did the costumes, was UK. The cinematographer had done a lot of European films. And I think Todd Haynes, one of the greatest American independent filmmakers working today, has a very European sensibility. So we really highlighted that. And of course, because of the profile that that film got, which meant that media were also able to brand themselves with that film. You know, you'll often see Carol mentioned. Um, so that was really... Uh, a very important film for us in many ways because then when we went back to media when it was very tough and very competitive we were able to put films like Their Finest and Limehouse and Chesil Beach and Colette on there and discuss them in the vein of Carol. We tend to make quite um, female-centric narratives. I mean just about well, I guess all of those films, actually, Chesil Beach, Byzantium, Finest, Colette, they all have women at the center. It's just stories that we're drawn to. Um, and we talk about, I hate the word, but a universality, um, a universality of narrative and emotion where those films can work in any territory around the world. And we also tend to pull our finance internationally as well. Um, and, you know, with our finest, we were working with Lona, we had Swedish money. So I think we genuinely, it wasn't like we needed to try and put square, square pegs in round holes. We genuinely did fit because we found it is the way that we work. We do look to killer films because they feel very European too. And it's no surprise that Christine, you know, her family comes from France. But we, we do turn to Europe and we find ourselves very comfortable working within Europe. So... Yeah, sorry, that's a long-winded answer. No, I don't know if I got there. That's exactly that's exactly what it is. That there is a, I mean, I think in the UK we we tend to aim for international market anyway, but the sort of um, most common understanding of that international market is English-speaking international market, and very little of international uh, sorry English speaking is on the continent. Right, the only other country English speaking is Ireland. In, in Europe. So there needs to be that um, shift always. We, we, we spot it in the applications that the, you need to be facing the continent a little bit more because that's, that's the European fund. That's what we're after. We're building European film industry. On that note, because we, we're running out of time a little bit, but I think um, we, need to, we need to have that reflection about are we part of Europe? Or are we not part of Europe? This morning, are we part of Europe? So, well, I'm, I'm a little bit more upbeat since uh, our Prime Minister's breakfast uh, today, but um, I'd like to ask you this question on a very sort of profound and philosophical level. Um, whether we are part of the EU or we're not, uh, going forward, our, our future, do you think is, is going to be are we drifting sort of into the Atlantic and we'll be more connected with our English-speaking friends in North America or the ties with, with the continent will survive this storm and we, we will creatively and philosophically remain? <laughs> I mean, I suppose surely we will while there's people who want to. And I think I was actually curious when you were talking about the um, with youth, whether the film for um, deal you had, I guess that wasn't, it didn't have to be a British film, did it, to, to qualify for that? So that feels, I was like hearing that, I thought, God, that's amazing actually, because the studio canal, the material was good enough for a sales company to think it was viable and a TV company think they could show it. And 
and put that money in as a kind of commercial product. And that didn't matter. It was sort of non... It wasn't a territory thing. So that that feels really encouraging that there was still able to be that link. And, and I suppose with I'm Not a Witch as well, it wasn't an official mm -hmm. co-production. So that's good. But I mean, it would be great if if there could be more official ties and if we could still have access to media and because it's always, it does already feel like we're a bit distant without it and so, even before Brexit and so, um, and I know I have heard of people thinking about, set, you know, British producers setting up a UK, a European base for their company as well, outside the UK in order to still be a European producer. Um, so it will be sad if it has to come to that, but yeah, hopefully not. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, speaking for ourselves, I, I think we always look to Europe. We just are facing Europe and feel a part of it. And I, I just think we are European and there couldn't be anything better than being European. And, you know, I would hope that it makes everyone actually feel more European and realise that, that our history over the last hundred years has been a really wonderful and harmonious one and the fantastic cultural things that have come out of that and, and not just culture, you know, scientific, technological. Um, so, yes, I just, we are European. You know, there is also, as we're an industry which has a sometimes uncomfortable um, meeting of money with creative ambitions and intent and you also have to face the fact that the Amazon and Netflix are very, very, very rich and they it's American money and they are not, um, they don't come to the job as from a, their, their, their remit and how the, the seeds of their beginnings are not film. You know, as Jeff Bezos says, I sell shoes, that's what I do and it's, very likely that the heads of those companies, not likely, sorry, it's possible the heads of those companies will say, actually, we did the film thing, we're not interested, we're going to go back to the shoe thing. And, you know, um, they didn't come into it as filmmakers, so it's a, it's, a, it's a new area. But, you know, some people who read in the press will say, well, what will happen is Netflix and Amazons will just do deals with writers. You know, they'll just pay huge sums of money and those writers will just write for Netflix or just write for Amazon. And how that will change things, I don't know. I mean, people, you know, clearly it's been hugely beneficial. They're both making great and interesting work. There's some things that are wrong with it that need to be addressed. You know, you don't know what your viewer levels are. They famously, you know, don't publish them. And so there's a lot of stuff that has to be addressed and I don't, you know, we don't have time now to go into the implications of that, but there is serious American corporate money which is coming in and that will have an effect on the creative movement of the industry in Europe. Well, if there's someone to take on corporate American money, that is European Union, no else. <laughs> so, we'll see. We need to, well, we, we've always had to adapt to something new. It's not an industry that is in a standstill. It's always, there's always something new 